It's my great pleasure to welcome Dennis Lee today. Uh, Dennis comes to us from across town at Amazon, but we're really welcoming back Dennis because before he joined Amazon in 1999, he got his very own PhD from this very department. So it's always nice to have him back. I think he's gonna tell us a little bit about what he's been doing at Amazon in the meantime, but my short version of the story is if the website hasn't worked for you, it was Dennis's fault. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Um, so a little bit about like things I've been thinking about a lot lately. Um, so it's a management talk. Uh, that's what I do now for a living. Uh, and, uh, and a little bit of interesting stuff uh, that's cross-functional uh, stuff around, uh, uh, that's across of like software development and uh, other techniques from other fields. So um, there's been a lot of, oh, sorry, introduce myself. <laughs> so uh, I grew up in the Philippines. I was at Cornell University for a little while, uh, went here since 99, and then I was at amazon.com for seven years left for two, then uh, was back. And past three years, I was in China, uh, running the China website. Uh, and so uh, I've done a whole bunch of stuff at Amazon. It's a place where they encourage you uh, to uh, explore many different, uh, many different things. I've done supply chain. Uh, I've done merchandising on the website. I ran the website actually, so a few years ago, if the website did go down, my phone would be ringing. So um, then did grocery logistics for uh, Amazon Fresh. Uh, in the past three years, I was uh, working on the China website, and right now I'm with the Kindle group. Um, so here's the problem. Um, software design processes fail, and they fail quite a bit. Uh, even though like, we have lots of literature around how to build uh, successful software systems, uh, people read Mythical Man Month. Uh, recently, there's lots of talk about XP, Agile, Scrum. Uh, there's the Agile Manifesto. And yet, you know, software fails all the time. Um, and uh, I, I looked this up uh, as I was preparing for this talk. And uh, a 2012 study from McKinsey says that of 5,400 large software projects they, uh, they looked at, uh, about 17% of them were so bad that they, the respondents said that it put their company at risk, right? Like existence risk. Uh, and then on average, uh, 45%, uh, they, these things would be 45% over budget, 7% 7, 7 over time, and would deliver 56% less value than what they're expecting. So, um, you know, if you look at startups, you know, software startups, 30% of startups just die. And three out of four startups don't uh, exit with enough to pay back the VCs that uh, funded them. So, what's going on? Well, I mean, software processes, you know, pretty straightforward. We do this at school, right? So, you get, you get requirements, and then, and then you somehow uh, have to deliver it to the, to the customer. And most of the time, you go down this process. You get the requirements. You design the software. Uh, you implement it. Uh, it's kind of like buying a house or getting a house. You build a house. You have an architect. And then, uh, and then you get a builder. And then you go build the bottom layers. You get your utilities. Uh, and then you build a house on top, and you finish it off. right? Well. So let's add a few requirements to this. So this is a classic, uh, a classic graph. Uh, bug fixes are more costly to repair uh, the further along this process you go. So if you get it at the requirements phase, then, uh, then it's easy, because it's just a piece of paper. You get the design phase, there's more pieces of paper to deal with. Uh, when you code phase, now, you know, some people have worked on it, and then, and then you have to go back to the people who did the requirements, because they have to agree to that. Um, then if you're testing, there's more stuff happening, and then acceptance testing, and then by the time you get to operations, um, it's, uh, it's pretty expensive, right? Um, 
So when people see this graph, you conclude that you should invest your resources and time to get the requirements right, because it's the cheapest place, right? And um, they, they talk, uh, so if you do that, then you say, well, okay, so my observation is that bugs found earlier in the development process are less costly to fix, so let's put time there, right? So I'm gonna keep going down this, and what uh, the talk will go through is to show you why this is actually not correct, right? Um, but it's a, it's a very interesting trap to go into. So now, here's a typical web architecture, and you have your database, you have your application server, you have your web server, and you have your browser. Um, and then the interesting thing about this is that at each of these layers, um, at the database layer, at the application layer, and you know, certainly at, at this point, you have different languages and different expertise. So you have database uh, developers, you have people who are good at uh, server-side development, and you have uh, web developers on the front end. So different expertise, uh, and so you have to hire different people for them. Um, and then this is a, just a standard communication graph, and the whole point here is just that as you communicate more, it gets more and more expensive. So if you have a big system and you want people to be able to run independently for some time, then you wanna kinda not have them talk all the time, right? So that comes up with two other observation that different pieces of the software require different skill sets and, so, and communication expensive. So what do you do? You break the problem up into subsystems and then defer having the teams talk until you absolutely, absolutely uh, need them to, right? And then, then you have most people who work on most systems, certainly this is the case with me, is that you work on successful systems, right? Like um, the systems that weren't successful are dead, so most people don't, aren't working on that. You get hired in and you work on the successful system. Well. Um, this is what happened. I went, uh, for me, in 99, I, the first day I joined Amazon, I did not have a seat, but I had a pager. And so, <laughs> at Amazon, developers carry pagers. Um, and every few weeks when I was on call, it was my turn to be on call, my pager would go off at 2 a.m. Every time. And everyone's pagers would always go off at 2 a.m. Um, there was this application that we built that would basically go and uh, figure out what we need to buy from our distributors, because we had a whole bunch of books in the warehouse, but there were other books that we actually had to purchase, right? Um, but this was built way back in the day when the business wasn't quite at the size it was, so they had scaling issues. Um, it was built for books in the US, and by that time, we had expanded over to uh, uh, to music and C uh, sorry, CDs, uh, DVDs, and uh, video cassettes, uh, and we were in Germany and the UK. And so this piece of software was starting to kind of creak. Uh, and then the design was ugly because the guy who built it, like you know, probably had a week to build it, and and he built it as fast as he could. Uh, and then other people then subsequently came and they had not just as much, uh, just as little time. And then, so, in, so that they didn't want to go change the program, so what they did was they wrote application uh, scripts that wrapped this program and then, uh, and then co converted uh, the output to something else, which made the system even more complicated. So I took that and I said, gee, this sucks. Uh, took a few weeks did a quick rewrite of the application because you know, I had other things to do um, and then uh, to make it better suited the business. But in parallel, and this is what was really exciting, we had a bunch of people who were working on the scalable, flexible, uh, super you know, duper uh, system, right? So then now, um, oh, so the other side of the story was my, the system I wrote in six weeks lived on for the next few years, the system that was super duper and great, 
uh, actually uh, got canceled about six months later. Uh, so, um, but if you look at the observation and what people learn, and you say, well, gee, a large amount of our time, of our software development time, is actually spending, we're spending retrofitting it for scalability, flexibility, and poor design. So, well, since we need to have this up front, let's design, let's put in flexibility, scalability, testability, security, and everything else way up front into the system. So you don't have to rework it, right? So this doesn't work. And um, let me give you an example of why. So uh, when I became a manager, the first person that worked for me was an intern. Um, and we had a system, we just built a, a really nice system and we thought we could extend it so that we could kill the buy box when something went wrong. Uh, every now and then there would be like, uh, there would be an error, maybe a detail page was not, uh, had some wrong information and we were getting customer issues, so we wanted to kill the buy box. And so we thought, hey, you know, this is cool, we could do this. And 12-week um, internship, not bad, first time manager, he said, well, you know, take two weeks to ramp up, then you build the database, you build the service on top of it, you build the UI, and then you have two weeks to integrate and test it. Well, as it happens, things happen like they normally do. Um, things took more time. Uh, it took a little more time to ramp up. Uh, the UI took a little more time. The service took a little more time. By the end of the internship, this guy was done, right? Um, but they still needed to integrate. Everything was code complete. Um, but effectively, it wasn't very useful uh, because you couldn't just put this out in production. You didn't trust it. Uh, and, uh, and there were still APIs between the different systems that didn't talk to each other. So, so what's the lesson here? Uh, the, it turns out, like, what I learned from this is, like, you know, integration actually is hard, and it's harder than people realize. Then the other thing that happens a lot is this vicious cycle. Um, you promise, and the story here happens something like this. You promise someone that you would go deliver something at a particular time. Uh, say, oh, I'm going to give you all these, uh, re this rewrite of this software at this time. And then, and then what happens is either because you underestimated or just by sheer probability, because these are estimates anyway, um, you're running a little late. So then they're like, well, you know, since you're in that code anyway, can you just go do this for me, right? And so you add on more, right? And, and then your things are even more late. Well, but you're like, okay, well, you know, I'm smart. I'm not gonna let them do that, right? Um, but it actually happens quite a lot. And, um, and, and here's an example of how this happens, but a little differently. So um, in my current team, like this conversation happens. Well, hey, we're late on project X. And, but in order to get to project Y that we promised three months later, we have to start now. Otherwise, Y is late, right? And so why don't we take someone from project X and move them on to project Y, right? Uh, so that project Y won't be late right now. So this sort of stuff, uh, uh, this actually, this conversation happens. And if you notice, this is just a different version of this vicious cycle, because now X is even later, right? And instead of having one thing be you know, somewhat late, you have two things that are kind of late. And then you're not getting value out of the software investment that you're putting in. So, um, so how do we get out of this uh, sort of this this cycle? Um, the the thing is, like you have to go back and take a huge step back and say, what is really going on? What are we really trying to do with software? Well, you're delivering value, but value is sort of a vague term. Um, so value really is judged by the customers when they try out your product. Right? Are they willing, if, if you have a product that people pay for, are they willing to pay for it? Right? Um, 
if you have a product, they're making them more efficient. Are they more efficient, right? So customers have to get their hands on it. Um, the other observation is likely we're, we're building the wrong product. Um, and the nice thing about getting things up in front of customers ahead of time is that then we know that we're wrong and we learn from that mistake. Um, there's a story that uh, Eric Rice, who wrote The Lean Startup, uh, gave. Uh, he, was, he, he was in a startup. It was a startup where he had an IM client. And they thought that the coolest thing would be to have this IM client cross-connect across all the different uh, uh, existing IM clients out there, uh, AOL, uh, AOL, ICQ, uh, Yahoo, so that people didn't have to bring in uh, new people into the network. And so they spent six months, and six months is a long time in uh, startup time, uh, building this great client. They had their debates about should you design well? Should you, uh, should, do you care about you know, like pretty design? Do you not care about pretty design? Uh, do you care about great engineering for scale or not engineering for scale and all of that? But six months later, they build it. And then they put it up on their website. And lo and behold, no one downloaded it. And, and Eric's uh, observation was, gee, I just spent six months building this thing when I could have spent half a day, put up a download link on my website, and just, and just learn the same issue I had. Um, so the interesting thing about this whole story is that it turned out that their users actually wanted to create a new social network. It turned out their users actually didn't want you interfering with their existing network. They just wanted to use the, this application to actually get new friends. But you know, it took them a while to figure that out. And the sooner you get to it, the better off you are. The last piece is everything changes. So um, if you have, uh, and the reason this is important is the following. If you, uh, a lot of times in the requirements phase is you're asking someone to tell you, hey, what do you think, I, what do you want, right? And if you go, if you tell me to shop and you say, hey, you can't go shopping again for three months, I guarantee you that 50% of whatever I buy from the grocery store, I'm gonna throw away, right? Uh, and in effect, when we tell our product managers, you know, it takes three months for me to build this, they, the human, very, very human uh, response to that is to do the same thing as what, you, what I would do at a grocery store, is I would like try to think about everything I could possibly want and ask for it, right? So, um, so this was what we like the list we've been uh, getting through, um, and so, and I added those two. Uh, integration is non-trivial, and no one can predict the future. So, how do we get out of this? Um, I submit that rather than thinking about it as moving everything to the front and front-loading it, what if you break the problem up and instead you deliver faster? That way, as you walk this cycle, you get to your answers and you learn in a faster way. Um, and so that really is key. Um, but then you still have the issues around uh, cross-functional teams, people not, uh, not knowing things, uh, not being experts, so instead of instead of breaking up your teams in these subsystems, breaking up teams into uh, people who know these subsystems, you invest in cross-functional teams where you have more or less a lot of expertise in a single team that can execute front uh, front to back. There's a difference between how you organize your teams and how you organize them for management purposes, and um, those are actually orthogonal to this. Um, and then scalability, flexibility, security, maintainability, all of that stuff. Like, you gotta accept, I think, that these are problems, if, problems that you have to face when you're successful. Like, at some point, you can't avoid them. Uh, however, the one place at this point that I think you need to put in, that we need to put in, is you gotta invest in the, uh, you gotta invest 
into infrastructure so that it's as cheap to change as possible. Because what, what allows you to maintain this agility over time is this confidence that when you change something, you haven't broken anything. So here's a modified goal. So instead of delivering an agreed upon working piece of software, what we really care about at the end of the day is what the customer cares about. And, and as quickly as possible, get it in front of them. Uh, and that's really, uh, that's really the key observation. Um, this, kind of, this comes out from the idea from the Toyota production system where they have this idea of one piece flow and uh, small batches. So a example of this is when we do Christmas cards. Uh, with Christmas cards, a lot of times uh, the, the algorithm we use is we fold the Christmas cards, then we stuff all the Christmas cards into envelopes, and then we put all the stamps on, and then we, put, then we write the addresses, and then we mail, it, mail off the batch. Well, that's great for Christmas cards, but it turns out, like if you go to YouTube, you, there's a video of someone doing this, and it turns out it's actually faster uh, to like do, do it all one at a time. Um, but it also has the other interesting property where if you do that Christmas cards in batch, between the time you start your Christmas card collection to the time the first Christmas card goes out in the mail, it's actually a long time, right? And if you think about that in terms of software, if you do a lot of things all at once, then the time at which you get the first piece of value out of your software efforts is actually fairly far out if you do a lot of things at once, whereas if you do full functionality, you organize that way, then you get, your, uh, you get value quite, quite rapidly. Okay. Oh, um, and then feedback. So uh, the other piece of that is if, let's say you folded your envelopes, let's say your envelopes were, uh, your, you folded your cards, or let's say it's mail, uh, a letter. So you're folding your mail and you're putting them in envelopes and you folded them a little wrong so that they're a little too big for your envelopes. Now, if you do them in batch, you won't find out that there's a problem until you've already folded all your letters, right? So, so it's sort of the same general idea. All right. Um, so actually, it's the other part of this that's uh, from a management point of view that's counterintuitive is that actually keeping software quality high is somewhat expensive, right? Um, because, uh, you know, like instead of writing new code for new features, at some point you have to write new tests and you have to modify tests to adapt things. Um, and what I do for my team is our software repository is set up so that it's ready to deploy all the time. Um, I kind of ran a, a quick, you know, back of, uh, I ran a quick gut check on how much time that uh, we, we were using for testing and refactoring. And in the group that I had where we actually did this all the time, it's about half the time. And that's actually expensive. Um, and when we have major production issues, we actually took the team out and we, uh, we asked some fundamental questions. We did a postmortem. We say, well, could we have done this in tests? We modified our monitoring, uh, and then we updated the system so that it would not happen again. Uh, we had dedicated people who worked on production defects, uh, and in a particular, if you have a particularly bad quality week, we'd actually stop work on actual user stories, stop work on actual new features so that people could focus in on the defects. Um, and we scheduled infrastructure projects. So um, about, about, this is about the main thing that I uh, invest a lot in. So um, everything else I try to keep as lightweight as possible. So I minimize the number, amount of formal specs I write, uh, a lot of informal conversation among uh, people who understand products. Uh, we deliver a lot. We deliver often, uh, which really uh, takes the need of the specs to be much less. Because if you 
know as a, as a product manager that you're going to get another try at this if we don't get it right this week. You're not as anxious to have all the specs formally written out. The one thing I, I should say is like there's actually a drift problem uh, that, I, I, uh, that you should be aware of. If you don't know where you're going to head and you're doing local optima, then you might not be heading in that direction. So it's always good to have a beacon to head towards. Um, uh, customer focus is important. So uh, the reason that we can make some of these decisions is that my developers, our developers actually uh, understand the customer. So when I was working in the fulfillment centers, we would go down to the warehouse and uh, pick and receive and do all of that work on a fairly regular basis. Um, and that way, when we had the conversations with our customers, uh, we could speak their language uh, and we could translate the technical, uh, the technical jargon into language that they could understand. Uh, and then we could make decisions while we were in the code that would be aligned with what we would think the customer would want. Um, and uh, in the website, uh, my my developers go and uh, look at usability studies. We talk to customers. So really, really important to f for this stuff to work. Um, we minimize work in progress. So this example of the uh, Christmas cards. So work in progress is basically anything that is a feature that's half done, right? So you try to minimize that as much as possible. Uh, and if you think about that initial example I said about people asking me to start you know, project Y when project X was still uh, going, that's like another part of work in progress that, uh, that, that, that I put into the queue, right? We do lots of experimentation. Uh, we do lots of A-B tests, seeing what works, what doesn't. Uh, we know that things are not gonna work out, so a lot of this experimental code is very, is as lean as possible, so we don't have to, because uh, we, we know a lot of it we're gonna throw away. Um, and finally, we keep the code clean and well tested. So here's a case study of where this works. So this was about four years ago. Um, and what we were trying to do was we were trying to improve the efficient, efficiency of the pick process. We had multiple processes uh, that ran in, in parallel, and they kind of came came together at the end to put together a basket for the customer. Um, what we wanted to do was to go and to get a single, uh, a single flow. So basically you would pick and you would pick directly into the customer's, uh, the customer's tote, the thing that we delivered to you. Um, when we thought about this, we said, well, look, um, it seems like we needed to have the software uh, gather weight and dimension data for all the items in the warehouse. Um, it seemed like, hey, we needed to virtually pack all the items into totes so, so that it doesn't overflow or it's not too heavy. Uh, and then uh, at the end, we should weigh the tote uh, so that we would have picking errors. And then the other thing we said, well, well since we don't have all the items that would go into a, a tote, uh, into a tote at the, uh, at, at the very end, we, we should uh, scan all the picking supplies so that we know how many, uh, if an item needed a freezer bag or, or like if a tote needed a freezer bag or a tote needed an ice pack so to keep items cool. Well, so look at, so what did we do? Well, um, one of the things that we learned was, hey, you always, ask whether you could get away with not doing anything. So the first question was, could we get away without weight or dimension data? Because getting weight and dimension data, it's actually kind of a pain, right? You have to get, you have to weigh everything, then you have to measure everything. And so we're like, well, let's do a quick prototype of something where, that we want to do without weight and dimension data. Uh, so I went out and picked, and it turns out one of the customers decided that it was the day they were going to order like, you know, 12 packs of Coca-Cola. Uh, and it just completely blew out my pick list. So, no, okay, we need weight data. But we're like, well, maybe we don't need dimension data. 
Because weight data is one thing, because you just put a scale, and it measures it, and you get all of it. So that's easy to get. But if you have to measure something, we actually had to go get what's th these things called CubiScan. And it's like a little device, and you, you put your item there, and it would, it would measure it. It's, it's another capital expense, and then it's another uh, piece of integration we had to code to. So we're like, OK, all right, let's try weight data first. So we got weight data, and then and we did the picking again. And then, lo and behold, a different customer decided it was their day to, uh, to be stocking up on toilet paper and paper towels. Uh, very light, but man, it doesn't fit. Uh, so we ended up having to do both, right? Um, the other thing we thought is, well, you know, we virtually we have to virtually pack items into totes, so this is a bin packing problem. And if you think about the 3D problem, it's actually quite complicated. Um, it turns out we did have to do that uh, piece of software, but we didn't have to do the full 3D packing problems. Uh, what we what we ended up doing was we tried we ended up making it a 1D problem. So we said, well, here's the cubic volume of the tote, and here's the cubic volume of all the other stuff in the tote. And we just tried to fit it. Uh, and for the most part, it was right. And then there were, would be exceptions, obviously. Uh, and we just gave away for the associate who was picking it to, uh, to deal with the exception. They just said, oh, this is an exception. And then we need a new tote here. So that, that worked out really well. Um, so weighing the tote to check for picking errors, turned out we didn't need it. Uh, it was. Uh, the error rates we were getting with this versus uh, the old process was about the same, so we didn't need anything there. Uh, this uh, checking uh, for picking items, picking supplies, this is actually interesting because we actually implemented this and then we take, took it out because it was actually more of a pain for our associates to be uh, scanning every single ice pack into the bin uh, rather than us just getting a, uh, just getting a list of items for them to put in each particular, uh, each particular tote. All right, so a summary of this. Uh, so you deliver often, you, we limit work in progress, stay in touch with the customers, and uh, keep the cone clean and testable. So uh, one of the things that I kind of thought about kind of coming here is like, well, what are the things that worry me about like what's going uh, with my team? And one of the things that I really, really think hard about and saying, well, how can I get them to test more, right? Because it actually is hard to write tests. Uh, it's not natural. Uh, it's not part of the language. Uh, there's really nothing that nags at you. Um, and it takes about, it, it, I claim it takes about an order of magnitude more discipline to write be disciplined in writing tests than it is to write a good, uh, to be disciplined in having good OO design. And certainly much harder to write tests than keeping your type safety. Because if your types aren't safe, compiler not going to let you go, go forward. Right? So, um, so something that uh, I talked to a bunch of folks who uh, work with uh, Michael. And I'm super excited about the work they're doing here. Uh, anyway, so that's most of my talk. And I'm um, going to leave you with a cartoon that uh, I found that sort of kind of summarizes uh, the, the insight uh, that I've been talking about here. So at the top, kind of a, a typical project, you do your components. And then you end up with something you're not quite sure about. And at the bottom, you know, standard, uh, you start out small and you end up with something great. All right, so thanks. So we have plenty of time for questions. Yes. So I think that rapid delivery has this problem. For example, you might ruin your image reputation for that product, the next time you release a patch, say, oh, we didn't get it right the first time, but this fixed it. 
your customer might not believe you. Ah, oh, right. So you don't need to have all your, uh, all your development to be customer facing, right? But it has to be, it, it has to be somewhat customer facing. So here's an example. So the picking thing, the picking software that we did, um, we were releasing every week on that. Um, but this, the associates in the, sorry, go, going back. Uh, I, I'm supposed to repeat your question. The question is, uh, with rapid application development, do you effectively lose trust from your customers because you're doing a lot of patches to their systems? Uh, and the answer is, your, you don't have to make them completely customer facing for all, for all your customers. So the example is that picking software I talked about, it was not released to the general FC population until uh, we actually used it. So, but it was usable from the very get-go. So the reason I learned or we learned that you had to do weights is that we could actually pick with the software, right? So uh, there's, there's a difference in having something that, you, that is out there running. So there's, actually, let me change that a little bit. So there's the difference between what you fi release finally to customers, so that's one set, right? Um, and the second set is there's something that is different about web software where you can have things that are out there but not active uh, that you can turn on uh, but doesn't really ruin the current experience. So yeah, no, I, I don't think, I, I, I agree with you. You don't want a lot of this intermediate steps to be completely exposed. But by having the discipline of getting it out on a regular basis takes up a lot of the risk. Right. What do you view as the, the most error-prone or uh, aspect of the software development process, or the one where you feel the greatest uh, improvement is needed, either from industry or from academia? So I find the UI part, uh, so the question is, what part of the software development process is most error-prone? Um, I find the UI part, actually, is really tough, because it's hard to specify, and it's hard to know what right is. Uh, but if it's wrong, it's kind of obvious that it's wrong. So, you know, um, I mean, you could get, like, I don't think we've pushed enough to make the easy stuff easy. So, if, for example, if you look at Selenium, uh, which is the standard UI framework, um, there's a lot of, like, the normal, typical asserts, but like, I don't think there's like an assert that this element is to the left of that element, assert this element is to the right or top or bottom or any of those kind of like just really interesting, useful feature. But, but that's just the first part, right? The second part is if you have, uh, you, you know, like if you have something that kind of looks uh, like out of place, how do you even specify out of place? I think that's, that really worries me. Uh, but you know, as a human being, you look at it and you're like, "Oh, of course, that's wrong." But so. So Dennis, I was going to ask. It seems like in the case of Amazon, as I understand Amazon's business, based on the principles you outlined, if you had some way to, for half the cost, deliver just as much value to 99% of your customers, that would probably be a very compelling trade-off. You might not want to admit it to the other 1%, but you know, that's part of delivering fast, maybe not with all the functionality or whatever. And, you know, is this just a matter of waiting? So first, guys, my first question is, is that a fair assessment? And, and second, you know, do you think things are fundamentally different for other businesses where they can't afford to lose that last 1%? of their value to customers? Well, it's, I think that's actually, a f well, so the 1% is important, which 1% that is. So here's an example, like way back in the day uh, in your account, it turns out it worked great for 99% of the people, but for 1% of the people who had more than a couple hundred items in their, you know, in their order history, it would not work. Um, Pretty, the people you care about. Yes, those are the people I care about, we care about, right? Um, so that's, you know, so it's important which 1%. But I think the, the, more, uh, the, the more interesting question is, do you deliver value to 99% of people first and 
or to 99% of the use cases. Because usually it's not people, it's usually use cases, right? And I, I think it really depends upon that 1% whether it's a big trust buster or not, right? Like if that 1% is, well, 1% of the time we're gonna lose someone's credit card, bad, right? But 1% of the time we don't, we don't show you a recommendation should you keep like not have the value of the other 99% and you know to wait for that 1%. Any other questions? Sure. Yes. So much of what you said is an affirmation of the agile methodology. You know, talk uh, talk more with customers, deliver more. Uh, what part of that methodology do you think doesn't work or has been uh, overrated or overhyped? And you would recommend people stay away from, if any. So, uh, so the question is, what part of the uh, the talk is a lot about, like how agile is great, uh, but are there places where agile doesn't quite work? Um, I would say that um, agile is sort of like a method to get to a result, right? Um, and there. Are like different methodologies actually espouse, have different levels of, of religion. Uh, so for example, if you're doing XP, people would say, oh, you should definitely do pair programming, you should do test-driven development, you should do you know, all of these things. To me, I'm like, my whole sense is I think the key thing is that uh, the fundamental thing that's important is that you figure out a way of getting getting your product to your customers as, uh, as soon as possible so you could confirm whether or not your customers actually care about it, right? So that's one thing. And the second thing is a way to maintain that ability to do it quickly, and that's where testing comes in. Um, everything in between, I think, is a set of uh, effectively a buffet, and you choose from those, uh, those as, as you want. Uh, and then the other part is be really careful because you could actually fool yourself into your doing agile when you don't ha when you're not delivering. Um, I have definitely met groups who are agile and they go into a conversation and they're like and they're not delivering and they go to a conversation and they're like, well, you know, you're the product manager. We give you access to my backlog and you get to pick whatever, right? But because you're not delivering, it actually doesn't work. Um, and the other one is the beacon issue, which is like you have to have a goal that you're going to that's more than just this week, next week, the other week, right? So you just have to know where you're headed and you want to make sure you're headed in that direction. Uh, and it's easy in an agile environment not to lose sight of where you're going. Languages and tools and things like that, is there anything that particularly stands out as being a good idea, a bad idea, or is it all just kind of lost in the noise as far as what you did? Uh, so the question is, uh, are there good ideas, bad ideas in, uh, in languages? Uh, boy, uh, I don't know. I think different people have different opinions of that. Uh, uh, and I, I think whatever I say will be my opinion, right? Uh, right? Like, I love the type safety in Java that, you know, uh, I love if I could write something in ML and prove that it works after I compile it, that'd be great. But, you know, there's a cost to that, right? Um, on the other hand, I also love the fact that in Ruby, um, you know, there are some things that are so easy, easy to express uh, that I don't have to go through, you know, like, you know, something dot get dot something dot get dot something dot get, right? Um, so uh, I, I don't know that I, you know, I would, I, I think that's a, it's a, it's a preference. So certainly, you know, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't program an assembly if I had my chance, my choice. On the tool side, have you found anything in your teams, uh, a kind of tool in particular, that's helped you stick to uh, whatever process you're trying to stick to? Uh, are there tools that help you stick to the process you're, you're sticking to? The interesting thing is that um, what I found is like teams that use uh, Ruby on Rails, for some reason, have more tests. Uh, and I think it's because Rails, as kind of like as the framework encourages you to have the tests, right? Um, the other part is actually like the MVC pattern. Uh, I was talking to someone today, uh, and 
like if you look at Java and you, you know, like people who write applications in Java or Rails, like the more modern ones, like all these frameworks encourage you to have an MVC, you know, model view controller or MVV, MVCC, you know, like, a, you know, some variant of that, right? But then you have the same developers and you have them start writing in JavaScript and like they don't naturally for some reason go to refactor your JavaScript in this MVC framework. And it's actually, I find that a fascinating read on sort of like how the framework encourages, uh, encourages a certain style. Um, my question was not so much related to your research, but since you mentioned you spent last three years in China, so how do you view Amazon's potential as a challenge in China? Because you know, compared to other countries where Amazon tends to be the number one seller, in China we have Tmall, we have Jingdong, and so the question was, uh, I was in China the past three years, and uh, there it's a much more dynamic uh, environment. What's my opinion of Amazon's potential there? So uh, like, uh, I forgot this disclaimer at the start of the talk. This is purely all my opinion, uh, and not the opinion of my employer. Uh, but the, the second part of it is, I, I, I don't think I think that's a question that's better answered by my CEO. Uh, uh, I will say this, the China, uh, for the most part, is an extremely much more dynamic market than people from the outside who haven't looked inside uh, know about. Uh, there are lots of interesting competitors with interesting business models. Uh, and it's, you know, if, if anyone has a chance, you know, uh, you should check it out. Um, you know, you can order furniture uh, custom in, and they'll get it to you from the factory in about six weeks, fully custom. Semi-custom, it takes about two weeks, and you can order it right online. With that, why don't we thank Dennis again? Thanks. <laughs>